Welcome to the regular meeting of the Public Works and Infrastructure Committee for September 14th, 2023. I am Andrew Johnson and I'm the chair of this committee. And at this time, I will ask the clerk to call the roll so we can verify a quorum for this meeting. Council Member Payne is absent. Wansley? Present. Vita? Present. Chukta is absent. Vice Chair Koski? Present. Chair Johnson? Present. There are four members present. Let the record reflect that we have a quorum. With that, we'll move on to our consent agenda. There are four items on the uh, consent agenda, which I will read for the record. Item number one is approving the establishment of uniform assessment rates. Item number two is authorizing a cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for proposed multimodal improvements along Hennepin Avenue and First Avenue Northeast. Item number three is authorizing a cooperative agreement with Hennepin County for the University Avenue Southeast and 4th Street Southeast Street Improvement Project. And item number four is designating the Hennepin Avenue South street reconstruction between Lake Street West, Douglas Avenue, and authorizing an agreement with MnDOT to receive and disperse federal funds for the project, setting a public hearing for October 26th, 2023. And I will see if there's any discussion on the consent agenda or if there are any items that anyone would like to pull uh, for further discussion. And I'm not seeing any, so all those in favor of the consent agenda, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed say nay. That motion carries. And now we will move on to our first public hearing item today, which is considering the 2024 operating plans, special services, cost estimates, and service charges for 50th and France, 54th and Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, Lindale Lake, West Broadway, improvements, uh, special service districts. And uh, with that, I will ask Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. David Bauer, special service district project manager, transportation maintenance and repair will be presenting. Excellent, welcome Mr. Bauer. Thank you. Thank you, Margaret. Uh, Mr. Chair, members of the committee, uh, Chair Johnson, members of the committee, a special service district allows property owners in a commercial area to collectively impose service charges on themselves each year to create a pool of funds. These funds are directed back in the form of enhanced services and special amenities. The enhanced services and special amenities are over and above what the city ordinarily provides. Each special service district is guided by an advisory board that is composed of property owners or their representative within a district. Each advisory board recommends services, service frequencies, estimated budget, and the service charge methodology for their district. For today, we have the 50th in France, 54th in Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, Lindale Lake, and the West Broadway Improvement Special Service Districts all seeking approval for their 2024 proposed services and service charges. These districts are referred to as 428A districts. 428A refers to the Minnesota statute, which grants municipalities the authority to establish special service districts by local ordinance. All special service districts before you today were established under that statute. And just a note, at the upcoming October 12th Public Works and Infrastructure Committee meeting, I'll be before you again to present the 2024 budget request for our legacy districts. These districts predate the 428A statute. Over the summer, Public Works staff worked with each district's advisory board to recommend the services, prepare a budget, and review their assessment methodology for the coming year. These service charges would be collected on the 2024 real estate taxes in the same manner as special assessments. Each affected property owner was mailed a notice of the public hearing and service charge amount 10 days in advance of this public hearing. Also included in the mailing was a copy of the proposed operating plan and budget. Staff, therefore, recommends passage of the resolution approving the 2024 operating plan, special services, cost estimates, service charges, and the list of service charges for the coming year for the 50th in France, 54th in Lindale, Bloomington Lake, Chicago Lake, East Lake, Lindale Lake, and the West Broadway Improvement Special Service Districts, and authorizing the Department of Public Works to proceed with the work. And lastly, I'd like to note that the combined budget cost estimate for these districts amounts to $833,400 in private investment within the city of Minneapolis public right away. That concludes my presentation and I'm happy to do my best to answer any questions. 
Thank you so much for the presentation. I appreciate it. I will go ahead and open the public hearing because I'm not seeing any questions from colleagues. And I will turn to the clerk and see if anyone signed up to speak. No one has. And so is there anyone in the room that wants to speak? Please come on up. Please come on up to speak, yes. And afterwards, I will ask you to check in with our clerk to sign in. But you can come right on up right now. Welcome. And I will note that uh, for this and the other public hearings, we do have a timer. Uh, so we give everyone two minutes at committee to speak. So the floor is yours. Welcome. Well, thank you. Uh, I, I didn't know what the process was here, so I'm sorry I didn't sign up in advance. You're good. But uh, I have two points today. I have a building at 39, 39th and Lake, uh, where the Blue Moon is, well, it was, and now it's called Milkweed a Cafe, and there's the Jaime's Records. Plus, we have a, a residential apartment above one of those. Uh, I've been there since 1992, and um, have, have had tenants all that time. Uh, I have two points to make here today. One is Lake Street is currently uh, suffering from a disaster. It's an utter disaster created by the city, the county, and that council. Uh, and the special services district can't do anything to make that street look better, at least not this year. So my request would be that the city rescind for one year because the businesses, my tenants are suffering they're suffering greatly. I interviewed 16 owners or, prop or business people in my area, so to the river and then all the way up past 31st. Every single one of them, two of the person, said they got no notice whatsoever of this disaster coming. They made investments on things they never would have done if they'd known what was gonna happen. Now there may be really good reasons to do this, but to do it without notice is unacceptable. The second issue I want to bring up is that when this was all being discussed with the rebuild in 2007, I think it was the rebuild of Lake Street. When that was being discussed, the business people met. We met many, many, many times over three years to discuss this. And during those meetings, we wanted to keep the four lanes of traffic and parking. That was our position. The city and the county wanted to make it three lanes in a turn. So at the compromise that came back from the county, I think the county was negotiating it. They said, we'll give you four lanes and parking if you'll accept the special services district. And that was the deal. That was made in 2007. I'm going to ask you to just wrap up because we're at time. I will. Thank you. Uh, so the point being that we made a deal with the city and the county and the Met Council that, that has been completely violated now without any notice to us at all. So our point, many of us are saying, that since this, that our agreement was violated, that the special services district should also be rescinded. So I thank you very much. Thank you, and please see our clerk uh, to sign in. I wanna see if anyone else is here on this item. Please come up and speak and uh, introduce yourself and then Come say hi to the clerk. Hi, I will get over to you in just a second. And I wasn't going to say anything, but um, John so eloquently came up, so I feel like I need to. My name is Tracy. I own Merlin's Rust Pub on East Lake Street. I've been there for a little over 16 years. Um, I would ask that you don't pass this as well. When this project came up with the uh, new um, bus line, um, I have to be honest, I don't feel as if I was given adequate notice and it has directly affected my business um, to the point where I can no longer have a patio or a sidewalk cafe feeling comfortable having that um, with a bus stop right in front of my pub. Um, I also have new challenges, such as people coming in and trying to use my restroom, um, so I, I have to have more staff. I'm just asking that maybe a little reprieve. Um, we're coming off COVID, and I know that was three years ago, but um, we haven't seen the inflow of customers coming back, um, and I'm concerned. I think that, as uh, Papa John so um, put, that there are a lot of concerned um, business owners on East Lake Street. When 
when this started, uh, or when the, we figured out that this was gonna happen, there's a tree in front of my building and they said they weren't going to do anything to that tree or that that would be replaced. Um, I don't feel that it should be my responsibility any longer to take care of a project that the city shoved down our throat. And that's really how I feel. I feel as if, as if it was, I was blindsided with this project. My voice has not been heard during this project. And it's not, you know, I would say that I'm not a young business. I'm a 16 year old business. I'm an institution on East Lake Street. I have helped change what Lake Street looks like. I know that I'm a responsible bar owner. And I just, I, I just, I think that it's time that we start listening to the owners of the thing that the businesses on um, Lake Street and other places. I think this gentleman over here gave an eloquent presentation, um, and we don't always get our voices heard or ho know how to get our voices heard. So I'm just asking that maybe you consider maybe a year, two years, give us time. I don't know what this bus stop is going to do to my business. I can tell you that my gut tells it, it's gonna hurt it. Um, and it may mean that I no longer can have a business in Minnesota, so there. Thank you. Is there anyone else here to speak on this item? Not seeing any, I will go ahead and close the public hearing. I know we have one council member uh, for comments or questions, but maybe I'll ask Mr. Bauer to come back up and just speak to for a moment. We did hear concerns raised during the public hearing around this county project uh, and in partnership with Met Transit. And I, I have heard outside of this meeting concerns around lack of notice to the business owners. I'm very interested to hear about the potential impact that this has on the special service district and their ability to administer this, uh, th their duties to add the value this year. So. If you have any details you could share. Yeah, that with sure. Thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. We did meet with our advisory board multiple times from East Lake, and uh, these same concerns were echoed to us in those in those meetings. Um, there was, you know, back and forth on what to do with the budget, um, and ultimately, our relationship with this project is just making sure that our special service district enhancements and the streetscape were moved out of the, the influence zone of construction and saved, stored, um, but make sure that we are maintaining them and keeping track of them and putting them back out once the project was complete. Um, north side has been done, so everything has been restored on the north side. South side, um, construction is still going on, so once construction completes, uh, we'll get our stuff back out there in permanent locations. Uh, just to add to it, um, you know, it's not a special service district project. We, there's weekly meetings with, uh, you know, Metro Transit, Hennepin County representatives that I sit in and, you know, get updates, and pass along to constituents when, uh, when it's asked of me. So I'm trying to keep people in the loop. And uh, as far as services go with the service district, We've been, you know, monitoring what is needed out on the street, dialing things back with construction and trying to save some money for the property owners and be good stewards of their budget. So we are actively monitoring the situation, only doing what's necessary, but trying to maintain our infrastructure as we're tasked to do. And Mr. Bauer, I think that that really gets to my question. So you said you dialed some things back, saving money for the property owners. How do they see those savings? Uh, are, is that something that happens sure. this year so, in this budget? Yep. Is that tr applied to next year? What does that look like? So all the dollars in our budget stay within the special service district. So any money that we don't spend is you know, going to be a surplus for the following year. So with not servicing um, those trash receptacles, you know, we're saving that money every, you know, that we don't send someone out there to empty things. And we're monitoring you know, the needs on the street and adjusting service frequencies. So when we dial back services with construction, we you know where there's not trash to be collected in that area. We are holding on to that money. It'll be, it'll stay within the East Lake Special Service District and our board will provide guidance to us as to what to do with any surplus or deficit dollars moving forward. 
Thank you. And I see a comment or a question from Council Member Wansley. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, you raised similar concerns that I had in terms of uh, communication to the business owners. What I heard from you was that there was communication to the advisory board um, for the Lake Street um, Special Service District and wasn't sure if there was a expectation that the advisory board members then do the more thorough outreach to business owners, just trying to get a better sense of how communication was directly relayed. Yeah, so our communication is with our advisory board. I don't have connections with, you know, everybody in the Longfellow or East Lake neighborhood, but those people that we work with to set these budgets and service plans, they're more plugged in with their neighbors. And um, through our communications that they would share information with their neighbors. And council member, I'm going to turn to uh, Director Anderson Kelleher on this. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Council Member Wansley and Council Members uh, of the committee. Uh, it's distressing to hear this today, and this is a project being led by Hennepin County in partnership with Metro Transit. I think that our team will be following up with their team because this is not the way we do business in Minneapolis in terms of notification of business and residents along a project. And so I don't really think, I, so I'm just, I wanna say, I do not think really the special service district team is the responsible party here because that would be a high expectation mm -hmm. to have these special service district boards be notifying their neighbors of what is going to be coming. It really should be the project owner and manager. And that is something that we can uh, be addressing. And so Mr. Dodds and I will be addressing that directly with the county and with Metro Transit. Just to follow up on that, as also as a council member around this area, I know I share that border with also council member Johnson, um, and soon to be council member Chavez. I think what's also distressing is there doesn't seem to be notification that was provided in advance to um, the number of businesses that are, you know, re basically residing along East Lake Street where this will be impacted. Um, and the fact that they're feeling like they're being blindsided. And what I heard was a rescinding of this or at least a pause until those business owners can be notified. I hear the desire to work with Met Transit because I've also been hearing those concerns for quite some time of how they're rolling out their project along East Lake Street and not wanting to conflate what they're doing with also with the city of Minneapolis. But as it relates to the special service dist uh, district, I don't know if business owners are not fully clear on what is being included in this proposal. It seems like they're just hearing another item or another financial burden that they're going to have to take up. So it would be good to have some time for those business owners to be at least thoroughly like ran through these services that their advisory board has recommended. And it sounds like at least I can only go from the owner of Milkweed and Merlins that that might not be the case for a number of the businesses there. So Mr. Chair, that's where I will turn back to the special service district manager to just maybe you could tell what is included in this special service district as far as services that would come with this. I will say on trees, I think we all know that trees are handled largely in terms of either taking out or putting in by the park board. The special service district businesses, I believe, do do some watering of trees, but that is not, they're not expected to be trimming or to be uh, taking out or replacing. My understanding is on this project, tree replacement will be happening, and I believe it sounds like it's happened on the north side already probably not on the south side based on where the timing is. But maybe could you um, go through and the services that are provided with the funds through the special service district? I'd be happy to. Uh, the core services that East Lake is doing right now are uh, we're emptying the trash receptacles. We're doing some maintenance on the landscaping beds in front of the parking lots behind the fencing. We are doing some pan and broom litter abatement. Uh, and graffiti removal in the public right of way. Um, and that's basically the whole budget is those services. And Mr. Bauer, maybe I'll uh, build on Councilmember Wansley's question. Is 
the advisory board in a position where if they wanted to do a pause because this is self-governance of the businesses, uh, it's their funds, they're putting them to use along the corridor, would they have authority to make decisions or advise in a way on how money gets spent and perhaps taking a year break on some of these services? Yes, Chair Johnson. Um, you know, they're an advisory board. They, they provide recommendations to the city and ultimately the city council is the entity that approves anything that happens out there and approves these budgets. So if they were to recommend to pause and do no services, um, we could remove the assets that we're maintaining and put, uh, the biggest change would be the receptacles that we've purchased and maintained would perhaps be removed and a solid waste and recycling aggregate container would be. Council Chair, Chair Johnson, Michael McLaughlin, Assistant Project Consultant to Public Works. I just wanted to add two comments uh, to amplify what David has already said. Uh, Council Member Wansley, you asked about the communication to the stakeholders in the, in the district. Um, this operating plan was, that describes both the budget and the services was mailed uh, at least 10 days ago to every property owner that is receiving charges. So this information was shared as we do every single year with the property owners that are proposed to receive the service charges. So this information, um, the city, we rely on the property owner to communicate to their tenants to share that information, um, so, but it, because the property owner is the one that, you know, obviously pays the property taxes. Um, the second piece on the, Chair Johnson, on the question of if the advisory board could have amended their services. In fact, hearing the concerns about the project, we actually reconvened this advisory board just a few weeks ago to give them, before things were mailed, to be clear, and before the notices had gone out, uh, to ask them the question to say, you know, do you want to reconsider anything given, you know, their frustrations that they've articulated to us about about the, the, the BRT project. So we did convene a meeting. We laid out the options with in an unbiased way. Um, we described what their options were. And at the conclusion of that meeting, they, they uh, sustained their recommendation to continue with the budget that you have before you. So we specifically did go out in, in response to the concerns uh, just to check in with them. And, and again, this was before sort of the train had left the station, if you will, on what you have before you today. Thank you. Council Member? Nope, that's all. Thank you. And the additional context and information is very helpful. I know this is a concern that's shared by other business owners as well along this corridor. And unfortunately, the communication issues are not unique to this corridor. We also saw those over off of uh, Cedar Avenue and 42nd Street, and now the county is going back and redoing some work there. And so I think Certainly, to the director's point, it uh, did not meet the notification requirements that we at least hold as a city and that we go out and do. And so when there are partners involved and we feel like uh, it's not uh, meeting those expectations, then that definitely warrants a conversation. And I appreciate leadership's commitment to that as well. So, And I thank our folks for coming here today and raising these concerns. And bring this discussion right into committee on this. And so I will see if there are any other comments or questions from committee members. If not, I will go ahead and move this item to our full council uh, with recommendation. Uh, all those in approval, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. And that motion carries. And so that item will be forwarded on to the full council for next week. And now we will turn to our second public hearing uh, today, our final public hearing today, which is considering the 2024 operating plan, special services, cost estimates, and service charges for the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District, DID. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Deputy Director Brett Jelly will be starting off the presentation. I know there will be a number of speakers who will identify themselves after Mr. Jelly. Perfect. Welcome, Mr. Jelly. Good afternoon, Chair Johnson and committee members. Uh, my name is Brett Jelly, and I'm a Deputy Director in Public Works. I am front, in front of you this afternoon to introduce the public hearing on the 2024 services and service charges for the Downtown Business Improvement Special Service District, also known as the DID. 
This is an annual hearing that is required as part of the City Council's review and approval of the district's proposed services and services, service charges for each year. The DID was established by Minneapolis Code of Ordinances in December 2008 and began full service operations in July of 2009. The district was renewed in 2013, 2017, and 2021. Each year, the DID's board, made up of downtown property owners, employers, residents, and leaders, establishes a budget for accomplishing their goals of making downtown Minneapolis clean, green, safe, and vibrant. Public hearing notices and proposed operating plans were mailed to all ratepayers. The DID hosted an open house on September 15th. This open house was advertised in a number of locations, including all of the hearing notices uh, in the DID Nicolet offices, office and on their website. The proposed 2024 service charges are $8,439,930. This is a 7.83% increase in assessments. I will note for the record that at least at last count, 12 letters of support have been entered to the, uh, submitted to the city clerk. And with that, I would like to introduce Catherine Rialli, who is the chief operating officer for the Minneapolis Downtown Council and the DID, who will give some highlights of the 2024 plan. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Johnson and members of the committee. As Brett said, my name is Catherine Rialli. I'm the Chief Operating Officer for the Downtown Improvement District. This is the 15th annual budget that's being presented to the Council for approval. I have been with DID since it launched in 2009, and therefore I have been involved in each one of these budgets. I can tell you that very much has stayed the same in these budgets and very much has changed. What has stayed the same is that the Ambassador Program has consistently represented 50% of our budget, this is a core program to the DID, and this is the program that we are most often identified with. What has changed is all of the other programs that have grown over the years, managed by our internal staff. These programs have expanded our work and community engagement, the maintenance and care of public realm improvements, and the increased need for us to provide a deeper response to quality of life issues. We have a small team at DID to make all of this work happen. I would like to invite some of them to come up and in introduce themselves and say a few words about the work that they will be doing that is represented in the budget before you. Great. Hello, Chair Johnson. I'm Lisa Midag, Director Kelleher and members of the committee. Um, I'm the Director of Public Space Engagement for the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District, and I'm here to tell you today about some of the things we do to support downtown vitality. Um, I'm hoping by now most of you have made it over to the 6th and Nicollet community space that we host and have hosted since 2017 in a vacant retail storefront. It's a great place for us to connect with people, everyone, anyone who comes downtown and hear about their experience and how we can make it better. We provide restrooms from that location, a cell phone charging locker, a water bottle filling station, and we can make connections for folks who need assistance to um, special services that um, the DID can help connect folks to. And if you need a break or a bit of fun and you're just in for a game, we've got some wicked, wicked chess players there as well. This year so far, we've served 5,500 folks from that location during the 800 hours we've been open there. Um, we've also served from that location our street food cart incubator program. This is a third year we've done that program with um, the Northside Economic Opportunity Network. This year we hosted Stop, Drop, and Roll, um, a, a POC-owned entrepreneurship business. Um, that sells really wickedly good um, egg rolls with like mac and cheese and jerk chicken inside of them. Um, you'll catch them down at uh, the Mary Tyler Moore statue most days. Uh, we also hosted our fifth annual Downtown Minneapolis Street Art Festival. This year we had 27 artists from five countries, including India um, and Turkey and Mexico, and we had live chalk and spray paint art happening over two weekend days, um, the second weekend in August this year. Um, that's two days of family-friendly performances, tours, and free activities for everybody. The last thing I wanted to tell you about, and it's new this year, is the Nicollet Exchange, which we launched in June in the vacuum left by the departure of the Minneapolis Farmers Market, Nicollet Market downtown. It's our new weekly sustainable community marketplace that took place over 12 Tuesdays this summer. 
It featured a cafe with food trucks, live performances, a free gift each week, um, sustainable vendors, and sustainable and green education opportunities. Um, and at the center of it was a community swap, the Nicolet Exchange, where you could bring um, a fashion item, a home item, a sports item, media or books, bring an item, get a voucher, and then shop the curated exchange. Um, we had 9,300 people experience the event this year, and we saved um, more than 500 items from potentially entering the waste stream. Good afternoon, Mr. Chair, members of the committee. My name is Ben Shardlow. I'm the Director of Urban Design for the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District, and I'm going to tell you about a couple of other programs. First, our sustainable greening work, and then an, an activation of an alley in downtown. So you heard in the introduction that greening is a core part of the DID's mission, and I'm here, and it's, it's a pleasure to do this, to shine a light on some of the work that we do behind the scenes and what we take greening to mean in terms of our work downtown. So since the very beginning, of the Downtown Improvement District, the DID has maintained enhanced streetscapes downtown. It's a core part of what we do. But for at least the last 10 years, we have been working quietly behind the scenes in many cases with uh, members of the city government or the county or the park board on making sure that there we're adding better infrastructure for trees to downtown as street reconstructions happen, as private property redevelopments happen. So for every street that's been reconstructed since 2013, I can say that we've been at the table helping to ensure that we're maximizing the number of trees that are being planted downtown and getting better outcomes for those trees. Um, one way that we've meaningfully added to that work is that since 2016, every single tree in its establishment period has been watered every week throughout its growing period as part of our, as part of our work. So if a tree has not succeeded downtown, it's not because it dried out. We've made sure that it gets the water it needs to get established. And a lot of this work happens through partnerships. Um, some of the work that we're doing right now is maintaining active partnerships with our colleagues and counterparts at the city and the, and the park board and the Mississippi Watershed Management Organization and also cultivating relationships with all of the five uh, downtown neighborhood associations to make sure that we're including residents in the beautification and improvement of, of their downtown as it overlaps with the DID. We have been growing that work by building our team. Uh, as of this year, we have a sustainability coordinator working on our team full time to support this work. And we've added two AmeriCorps members who work really closely with the AmeriCorps members that work within the city enterprise as well. So that plus, as I mentioned, the work with the residential associations, we're facilitating monthly volunteer opportunities for downtown residents. Uh, to participate in making sure that they're a part of the team that are making downtown cleaner and greener. Um, with the watershed, we have soil sensors throughout downtown, learning a lot more about what's happening below ground that's contributing to the outcomes for trees. And we also just recently launched with the Department of Public Works um, an adopt a rain garden program to make sure that all of the infrastructure that's being added downtown, um, that there's a pathway for people who care about it to be a part of the group, um, making sure that it, that infrastructure is successful and now for something completely different. My second project that I'm gonna present about is the Alley Project. Um, the first was about greening. This is more about safety and activation. So the Alley Project um, is a strategic activation of an underutilized public space to improve vibrancy and safety downtown. Um, the Alley is located on the block of, on the 900 block of Hennepin Avenue. You probably know it as the block where the Fair School for the Arts is or the Chambers Hotel. And this project is an example of how we work in partnership with the city and others to respond to challenges at, and opportunities as they arise. Um, in this case, in 2021, in the teeth of the pandemic, this block became the highest safety hotspot of concern in downtown. And based on that concern, we decided to respond to it, not just with um, our partnerships with law enforcement, but to try to get at some of the underlying reasons why that space wasn't successful. And we responded with um, activation and beautification and community partnerships to add positive activity to address some of the negative activity that was happening. We brought in a design team. Um, we put in an immersive wall and, and ground mural inspired by the, the historic flows of the Mississippi River. And we created a space where students at the Fair School for the Arts and the University of St. Thomas could come out and enjoy an outdoor space that didn't exist before and have their positive activity lead to a safer downtown for everyone. Um, 
Other programs that we have in that, in that area include uh, deploying a mobile coordination support center for all of downtown's outreach workers to take breaks and connect with each other and circulate through downtown. And it's also become a venue for Hennepin Theater Trust's 5 to 10 program with Culture Club Collaborative, a program that ran through the end of its second summer in the Alley Project this summer. So with that said, we're excited to sustain this project and grow it in partnership with the city. It is a city-owned alley and it requires close coordination with the city to do that. And we're excited to grow um, the environmental improvements and community partnerships in this space to create a safer and better downtown. Uh, Chair Johnson, committee members, my name is Jesse Osendorf. I'm the director of operations for the DID. I'd like to make some brief comments about DID operations, plan for 2024. We address a lot of things operationally in our downtown district, and most fall into one of three buckets. Uh, the first, already mentioned, our ambassador program, our largest and most visible initiative. All ambassadors serve a hospitality function, in addition to circulating throughout downtown on cleaning and safety patrols. We also have a specialized livability team that seeks out and inter inter interacts with those experiencing homelessness. The second bucket, greening functions. Our greening programs introduce colorful annuals in the summer and wreaths, garlands, evergreens, and ribbon in the winter to highlight areas of the downtown district. The third item, maintenance of enhanced streetscape features. Irrigation systems, uh, specialty lighting elements, public art installations are just some of the items included in our maintenance scope. So as we move into 2024, here are a few items that we'll be focusing on. We'll be evaluating new methods to keep downtown clean as our streets and sidewalks continue to become more populated with workers, visitors, residents, and events. In addition to the customary power washing and cleaning resources provided by our ambassador program, we'll be evaluating electric sidewalk sweepers that can increase the efficiency of collecting loose trash, dirt, and debris at an almost silent decibel level. We'll continue to support partners like Meet Minneapolis and local sports teams with our ambassador hospitality services. Friendly faces with information and directions enhance the experience of visitors at downtown conventions and events. 2024 will be the first full year of the DID maintaining enhanced streetscape elements on Hennepin Avenue. Irrigation systems, planting beds, and enhanced lighting are all part of our maintenance scope along the corridor. Additionally, holiday lighting will be installed on several blocks along the corridor for the first time since 2017. The final item I'd like to mention is the continued work on beautifying the north end of Nicollet. This area has changed dramatically since the Nicollet reconstruction with the addition of RBC Gateway 365 uh, Nicollet and a new, new Skyway co uh, connections that have come online. Changes to greening and streetscape structures are being explored to help accommodate more residents, pets, and events, such as the Taste of Minnesota this past summer that occurred on the north end of the mall. Now, I'd like to have the general manager of our ambassador program, uh, Lavelle Warfield, step up to briefly highlight some employment details of our DID ambassador program. Good afternoon. Um, first, thank you so much for having us here. Um, I do want to talk about our employees. We are staffed here with 76 employees, um, including myself here. With that, we have 59 ambassadors that are in our union here. Um, some of the other stats that are great to identify is just that we have 57 um, staff that identify as male, 19 that identify as female. One of the stats that I really love the most is the fact that we have 59 people that um, are Minneapolis residents, and so there is a shared connection to making sure that we <clears throat> have a deep impact within making sure our streets are clean and safe. And over 38 of our ambassadors and staff have been on for more than four years. Um, and as you can see, there's other statistics there as well, so I'll be turning this back over to Shane. Good afternoon, uh, Chair Johnson and committee members. I'm Shane Zahn, I'm the Director of Safety Initiatives for the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District. 
I'm going to keep mine short. Um, thank you for our team that came in. Um, but some of this visual just highlights how we've evolved in public safety. At our core, our ambassadors are out there Monday through Saturday from 6 a.m. to 11 p.m. and on Sundays, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m. We connect over 70 plus buildings, security operations centers through a common radio link channel. Um, our DID livability team is out there Monday through Friday, really hitting the street for those that are in need, that are needing connections to resources. Also our Hennepin County social workers, um, they, we have them out in the white van, James Seals you see here, um, making meaningful connections and also transports to 1800 uh, Chicago, the Behavioral Health and Wellness Center. We're now a Monday through Friday at nine to nine operation. Um, also, we hired Joe Kreisman, our DID social impact manager that has a lot more experience than I do in behavioral health. Um, he's launched our free community storage program, which, which is serving over 450 clients currently and over 1,100 clients since conception in 2021. And this is located in Ramp B uh, for free community storage. Joe's also working on, on an outreach incident management system. As you see this work, we don't do alone. Um, we work with um, Mad Dads Violence Interrupters that are out there Tuesdays through uh, Saturdays from 11 to 6 p.m. and 21 days apiece, 3 p.m. to 9 p.m. And then our Youth Link Partners and Youth Coordinating Board. So with that, um, and also the evolution just to public placemaking to make it safe and vibrant at the same time. So thank you, and I'll turn it back over to Catherine. So now we need to get to the numbers. Um, so we all know that these past few years have really been financially challenging for many of us, and we also know that these challenges are going to continue. Therefore, our Budget and Operations Committee that is comprised of 15 representatives of our ratepayers within the district is proposing a 2024 budget that represents only a 3.9% increase over the 2023 levels. This expense increase is also combined with a reduction in the uh, ability for us to use our reserves to fund these expense. This adds to the increase to the ratepayers, resulting in an approximate 8% increase in the assessments that will be charged. That concludes the formal presentation we have, and we're all available for any questions. All right, thank you for the presentation. I see a question or comment from Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, staff might also be able to speak to this, but interested in knowing how does uh, the police reserves, um, how does that kind of factor into a service of or administered through the special service district here in downtown, and if this is something that's typically available to all the special service districts? It is something we do with uh, Minneapolis Police Reserves through buyback, um, which comes through committee for approval as well. Um, just to be the extra presence. Um, really, it's about um, engagement, being present out there through a buyback program. As to whether it's available for the rest of the city, I'm not sure. It's something that we've started and really as a pass-up program for downtown for skills and a lot of uh, events that we have for downtown just for the summer. Okay. And glad that you mentioned the buybacks because I think through PHS or Public Health and Safety where we typically get buyback yeah. uh, contracts, approved i've only seen it for some of the larger stadiums like if there's something happening at the viking stadiums um not so much for i, I don't know how police reserves are administered throughout the week when there's not large-scale events i don't recall seeing those type of buybacks unless a buyback program has it where if it's below a certain dollar amount or so it doesn't come through council so it'll be interesting to know how those other proposals in addition to the large-scale contracts that we do see and approve um, through the buyback pro uh, program especially yeah. for downtown how that's being kind of filtered through the council process okay yeah i think um probably the best would be mpd and sergeant moda that runs the reserve program but um, yeah, it is, I think, something that's unique just to downtown right now, just because of the density and the events that we have. Um, whether it's scalable or not, that's, I, I'm not sure. I, I know uh, staffing has been very challenging uh, this year, um, so I know we've been very challenged to even get fill, uh, shifts filled, so. Yeah, I know we often hear, especially when concerns around buybacks um, or even off-duty of looking at our constituents paying basically double or triple taxes for existing service yeah. and if you know there's places across the city like east phillips or yeah. certain parts in my area of dinky town where people will love to be able to say if there's an extra fee to pay for the police which folks are like we should not be doing that um but 
just thinking of how are we double tapping and if that's a universal service. So it seems like it is particular to downtown. Yeah. Um, and then also it'll be good to follow up with staff of how those are coming through council yeah. um, for approval. So thank you. You bet. Thank you. Thank you, Council Member. Council Member Payne. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Uh, I was curious for the Safety Ambassador Program uh, if folks are trained in Narcan administration. Uh, they are not. Um, however, our county social workers and some of our outreach staff is. Um, and a lot of times we do our extra eyes and ears, especially for the overdoses. Um, we do make a lot of emergency medical calls. Um, so that just that presence there as well. Um, but currently our vendor block by block doesn't have our ambassadors on Narcan training. Okay. I, I'd encourage it. Uh, I actually partnered with SEIU to do some Narcan training just open to the community. But I know that they have a lot of security guards within their membership. And I, I just think anybody who can get that training, Great. the more the, the merrier. And then I got a follow up question on uh, the ambassador program. I did get a chance to tour the um, safety communication center. It was right across the hallway from the uh, fusion center in the first precinct. Yep. And I was curious from a budget perspective with that co-location, is that a in kind uh, line item from the city for that co-location or are you charged a, a fee to be co-located there? We are not. Um, but we do staff that with our staff and really is a hub to our outreach and our ambassadors and our um, security partners as well and residents too. So it's really the hub to a lot of our services just because of how big of scale we are. Yeah, and then so I want to put my four cards on the table. I want to see safety ambassadors on Central Avenue. I want to see them on Lake Street. I want to see them in Dinkytown. I want to see them on Broadway. Uh, obviously, uh, scaling up to that well obviously the financial arrangement of the special service district means that the money paying in is from your membership and so they're serving your membership but uh i don't know any other organization that is as far along operationally as you are when it comes to this type of presence in the community yeah. and i think one thing this is less a question for you and more of a comment for us on the dais of how do we find the financial operational arrangement to be able to facilitate these ambassadors across more parts of the city. And then so the operational question would be, uh, would that be something that would still be, like let's presume that we could find the money yeah. to offset that cost for the other special service districts that don't have the type of membership that you have. Um, and setting aside the labor market constraints yeah. that also exist. Operationally, how would you see scaling up yeah, if I think we would, could it find would that come kind of into budgeting for sure. Um, you know, we are actually, I'm flying down to Chicago, same with a lot of our staff. Inter uh, downtown improvement districts are out throughout the country. Um, so uh, I definitely think um, we move, we are setting the bar to a lot of the work that we're doing in Minneapolis, but we also are talking to a lot of other cities that are doing this work too. So we're not doing it in a silo, but I do think it comes down to really the budgeting and then the operations, right? So, but I, thank you for, you know, even considering. And I'll let Kevin. I just wanted to add also that it's, it's the money, but it's also the, to do the stuff that Shane does. It's the relationships you've built to be able to be embedded within the precinct offices. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's very important for some of the work that is, that is done. So it's getting the budget, but it's not getting the budget and having it all be done through a central place. It's really in each one of these communities building the same thing. So it's money and it's time. Director? So, Mr. Chair and Council Members, there is some work going on by existing special service districts, I believe two of them, to explore a more self-directed, self-governed model that would most likely need a state law change to be able to exist. But there, uh, those that type of model is a possibility for districts, um, but it does take as you can see, this team is a large team. So one of the things that our team has been working on is the um, uh, sort of the readiness of whether particularly Uptown and Dinky Town may be moving in that direction. And I think if they moved in that direction, it may allow for some other services that currently are not allowed under the 428A districts. And so that is something that um, I think it's important for that to be driven by the community members and not 
something that we sort of as public works necessarily are the uh, initiators of, but two have at least begun the process of exploring what that would look like. Well, I want to extend an open invitation to every single service district community member that wants safety ambassadors to get in touch with their council members. We have $19 million from the state specially set aside for new concepts around public safety. And I really want to see that be a reality. So I'm trying to manifest that into the ether. <laughs> Thank you, council member. Council member Vita. Thank you, chair. Thank you, chair Johnson. Um, no, just a few comments. The work, every uh, time I hear of the work of the DID, it's, it, it's impressive. You all do a great job. You have a great presence in downtown. Some of the most delightful people you can run into on a hard Thursday afternoon after a council meeting. So I encourage you all to keep up the really good work. You are noticed. I, I mean, I appreciate you all so much. I mean, cleaning, talking to people. Um, I was a little jealous this year because you got a lot of the sweet potato vines in the plant pots, and I got zero, and I noticed you had them everywhere downtown. And so keep beautifying downtown. It looks warm, and it looks inviting. I met a couple. I was um, out, and I met a couple. They were sitting in two chairs just facing Nicolette, and um, I said, oh my goodness, I have to be a good citizen of Minneapolis and tell them the parade was last night. I just assumed they were there for the Aquatennial Parade. And then I was like, I, ha I have to do it, I have to do it. So I go over and I say, are you all waiting on the parade? They said, no, we do this every night. We sit here every night, we come. I can't remember what suburb they told me. They said they come and sit on Nicollet Avenue every night and just people watch and talk to you all at the DID, get informed on what's going on in Minneapolis. Their commitment to our city is they want people to know it's safe downtown. You can come and see a ball game. You can have dinner. You can have a good time and you're going to make it home, make it home safely. I would say that you all have a big role in making that happen for them. So keep up the good work. You have my support. I appreciate you all very much. Thank you. And then uh, we have Councilmember Wansley, and then I'll open the public hearing because we haven't done that yet. And then we'll get through that and then close it and then any additional comments or questions. So Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Um, I did want to offer it, um, especially since Councilmember Payne raised the fact that it would be great if we could see a safety ambassador program expanded all across the city. And I do know in Dinkytown, um, a great deal of work that my office did along with uh, Councilmember Rainville and the University of Minnesota. And, tons of parents is to actually do that, actually implement and launch a safety ambassador program. Because I think what we're getting at is many of the services that's being purchased here, like snow removal, um, safety ambassadors, all those type of things, being able to have a social worker be dedicated. I think we all recognize that is not happening across the city in a very targeted approach or way um, and being able to expand that to areas, especially based off of our strategic race and equity plan that notes there are certain zip codes where those type of services are desperately needed and are not being provided. Um, so I think that gets at the core of what we would like to see, you know, DID, um, some of the, you know, unprecedented work that you've been able to accomplish be really expanded across the city. Uh, because while we know downtown is, is often framed as the economic engine of the, the city, the workers live across Minneapolis. Uh, the workers who, you know, are living, working, playing here, don't always just spend their time in, in downtown and they wanna be able to have those similar amenities in the places where they sleep um, and where their kids you know, play and, and, and all those things. So I think that is uh, a key factor, but I at least just wanted to amplify that one of the pieces that has come to Deking Town has been around this safety um, ambassador program and we're really excited to continue building upon that and hopefully expand that across more areas of the city. Excellent. Thank you, Council Member. With that, we'll go ahead and open the public hearing. And I have three people signed up to speak. And the first is Hannah Zinn. Welcome. 
Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and members of the committee. My name is Hannah Zinn, and I'm the Public Policy Manager at the Minneapolis Regional Chamber. I'm here today to speak in support of our partners and downtown office neighbors, the Minneapolis Downtown Improvement District, and their 2024 operating plan and budget. For nearly 15 years, DID has been committed to creating a better downtown for employees, residents, and visitors. This work is all the more important as we continue to welcome office workers back downtown. We know they can rely on DID to keep the area clean and be a welcoming face. They're also a highly visible resource for anyone who has questions as they are navigating downtown. This is particularly important for our small businesses that need those workers, visitors, or residents to shop, eat, and experience downtown. The DID is forward-thinking, adaptive, and creative, knowing that what was best for yesterday may not be for tomorrow. What was right for some may not be right for others. The diversity in services, as well as how they are delivered, is important. For example, the continuum of services available for those that may not have other resources, from a conversation on the street with the outreach teams, to the acceptance of services from the embedded social workers, to the basic need of having a safe place to store your personal belongings. We've also seen the adva advancement of sustainable principles in their work, especially in the work being done to take care of our valued green resources downtown. Finally, DID's ability to be nimble and adapt to the changing needs of downtown and serve as a resource for properties and businesses, while also having the ability to address problems with an operational response is something we can all feel proud of. We wholeheartedly endorse the DID and respectfully urge you to approve their 2024 budget as presented. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Inspector Peterson from MPD's First Precinct. Welcome, Inspector. Good afternoon, Chair and Committee members. Um, my name is Bill Peterson. I'm the Inspector of the First Precinct. Um, I'm here to speak on behalf of uh, DID and the renewal of their annual budget. I've been down, assigned downtown now for several years, and um, I've said it before, before coming downtown, I didn't know a lot about DID and the work that they did. Obviously, I saw their ambassadors spread throughout um, downtown, but in the um, several years that I've been down there, I found them to be a valuable non-emergency resource for the uh, community. The network of outreach and other resources that they offer are an important part of the services provided downtown. I know that Shane and others have done an outstanding job of touching on a lot of those different resources, but they're really um, an excellent conduit for us as our numbers have dwindled in the MPD. They're a conduit um, to help us provide um, all sorts of different um, outreach in the form of Mad Dads, 21 Days of Peace, YCB, um, the relationships that they have at YouthLink. Uh, the DID social workers have been an invaluable resource um, operating in downtown. I think it's a, a testament to the amazing work that they do do, the, um, the Council Member Payne and Council Member Wansley um, and others that you would like to see their ambassadors um, spread throughout the city. I think um, for somebody who's been in law enforcement for 28 years and worked in various areas of the city, I too would like to see them in uh, other neighborhoods uh, throughout the city. Um, they've uh, done a great job in helping um, put as you uh, previously discussed, these uh, police reserves out on Nicollet Mall, um, an added presence out there for us, the social impact uh, manager, um, the creation of the community storage program has been a, a huge help. I can't tell you the number of times that I personally reach out to them to help us keep downtown uh, clean with graffiti removal, trash uh, removal, and then uh, power washing. Um, they've helped connect the uh, business community and other downtown stakeholders with the MPD, particularly the first precinct by facilitating conversations geared at problem solving. I could go on and on and on about the number of um, you know, issues that we collectively uh, work on to uh, solve issues, but it was discussed the safety communication center at the first precinct, radio link, their safety workshops uh, weren't mentioned, but the number of safety workshops that they do um, for um, all members of the downtown community is remarkable. A lot of crime prevention through environmental design is done uh, with the partnership of DID. But um, I've essentially, they're an invaluable resource for us uh, downtown. Um, there's uh, roughly 1,800 events that they not only helped with the activation of, but um, assured public safety for um, in 2023. Um, you mentioned a few of these, but uh, Twin Cities Pride Parade uh, in, at the same time that Taylor Swift was in town, the Taste of Minnesota, the Aquatennial Parade and the fireworks. Um, the MPD uh, values not just the DID, but all of our non-sworn public safety partners. Uh, so much that just yesterday, 
we, um, in collaboration with the DID and our police chaplains, we uh, hosted a appreciation cookout at the Lemington Ramp. We invited over uh, 238 folks um, from traffic control agents to mad dads, mother's love, 21 days of peace. We pushed for peace, all of those folks. We had roughly 165 of those folks come through. Um, in short, uh, I speak in full support of DID, the work that they do. Um, I don't know what I'd do without them. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. And I uh, appreciate that. Uh, next up, we have Mr. Carlson. Chair Johnson, council members of the committee, my name is Dan Collison. I'm senior director of business development and public affairs for Sherman Associates. And I'm speaking today on behalf of the company in support of the proposed budget and operations. Sherman Associates owns and operates real estate, real estate across the city. But downtown is really special for us. We're, we've been here, we're committed to being here, and most recently we're converting a vacant commercial building that will have 20% of income qualified and 80% of missing middle called North Star East. We just opened up the Moment property next to Thriven that, will ha that has a newly opened child care center, coffee shop, and a nonprofit burn victim center for families who need free housing and counseling when they're at the hospital. We're additionally seeking to repurpose a half million square foot uh, building that's vacant on Washington Avenue to a mixed income community that will include, again, more affordable housing. And to Council Member Wansley's request that more people live downtown, uh, Sherman wants to see that happen. And 63% of all that we build is income qualified housing. We stand here today strongly in support of the downtown improvement district for all that everyone has shared and because I think they work for an inclusive and welcoming downtown through all those lenses of public safety and activation and representation and all that has been discussed. And our firm kind of believes that it is, that the DID brings critical human infrastructure to all of this built environment for which, yes, property owners like ourselves want to be diligent, but we need consistency across all the geography and they provide that. And so, I don't know of any other organization that pulls together so many public and private partners. We're one of the private partners that pays our dues and appreciates it and seek to also alongside them see downtown become increasingly inclusive, safe, livable, activated through the lens of inclusion, and therefore we fully support the budget and the operations that are in front of you today. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else here that uh, wants to speak on this item who did not sign up yet? Anyone else? Anyone else? Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and close the public hearing and I'll see if there's any additional discussion or comments from my colleagues. Not seeing any, so I'll go ahead and move approval of this item. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed, say nay. That motion carries. And uh, thank you to all the folks who came and spoke and presented on that. Next, we'll go ahead and move on to our discussion items. And our first item today is receiving and filing the Pedestrian and Bicycle Advisory Committee 2022 Annual Reports. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item? Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. Cadence Novak, Pedestrian and Bicycle Coordinator, Transportation Planning and Programming, will be doing the introduction of the other speakers. Welcome, Ms. Novak. And, and the beginning presentation, I should say, as well. Yes, Welcome. thank you. Um, thank you for the introduction. Um, as noted, my name is Cadence Novak, and I am the Pedestrian and Bicycle Coordinator for the city. Uh, before we get started, I wanted to highlight how valuable these two advisory committees are for advising our staff, elected officials, and partner agencies on the work that we do. So I'm going to ask that if you are a member of either of these advisory committees to please stand up so that you can be recognized. And if you are on the pedestrian advisory, oh yeah, let's do a round of applause. If you are on the pedestrian advisory committee, will you raise your hand? And those of you that are on the bicycle advisory committee, raise your hand. All right, and then I'll have you sit down in ascending order. If this is your first <laughs> term, go ahead and take a seat. If this is your second term, go ahead and take a seat. If this is your third term, if this is your fourth term, is anyone beyond four terms? All right. Um, so 
All of these members um, are very passionate, knowledgeable, and bring a variety of backgrounds and experiences that positively contribute to the planning and design process with many shared values that support mode shift and support safe, joyful, and welcoming pedestrian and bicycle environments for all people. I'm very proud to be the staff designee uh, for both of these committees and to co-present what is the 2022 Annual Pedestrian Advisory Committee Report and 2022 Annual Bicycle Advisory Committee Reports today. Um, just to note that throughout this presentation, you may also hear us interchangeably refer to the Pedestrian Advisory Committee as the PAC and the Bicycle Advisory Committee as the BAC. And with that, I'll go ahead and start with introductions. Um, one thing that I want to note is that before I joined the city, I was actually a member of the BAC and have firsthand experience of what it means to be a resident on one of these advisory boards. And it's been very exciting and enlightening to be on the staff side and learning how much I didn't know and being able to better support our members who um, are in the position where I was. And so with that, I want to introduce Alyssa Shovman, who is the chair of the BAC. This is her fourth term, and she is the elected chair of the BAC. Um, she might be familiar to many of you because she co-presented this presentation last year. And then Peter Vader is the chair for the PAC. This is, I believe, his third, fourth term. Many terms as well, and he's an at-large representative. And so before I invite them up to share their portions of the presentation, I just want to give a very quick overview of the PAC and BAC, which have different organizational structures. The PAC has 15 at-large voting members who reside or own a business in the city. The BAC has 13 ward members, three at-large Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board appointees, and 13 agency-appointed members from city departments and partner agencies for a total of 29 voting members. Both committees provide valuable feedback on projects, policies, and programs that further advances our division's work towards achieving the transportation action plan actions to make walking, biking, rolling, and connections to transit safe and more available to everyone. My role as staff is also to provide updates as well um, on the activities of the committees. I do want to take a moment to recognize some of our 2022 voting members from the PAC um, who have since moved on. Um, those names of those 15 folks are on this slide. And then honoring our 2022 voting ward and at-large park board appointees from the BAC. And those are 13 ward folks and three park board folks. And again, these are the 2022 memberships, so we do have new names of folks um, for our 2023 membership bodies. And so with that, I will invite Chair Peter Vader to the dais. Welcome, Mr. Vader. Thank you, Cadence, and good afternoon, Chairs Johnson and Koski, committee members. Uh, I'm uh, pleased to be here representing the Pedestrian Advisory Committee, uh, where I've been a member since 2017 and in my second year as chair. It's a privilege to speak on behalf of my members today, and as my first time before a city council, it's kind of rather a thrill. So, um, yeah, each month, the PAC examines through our engineering subcommittees uh, three to six projects from Public Works, Hennepin County, Minneapolis Parks, and MnDOT. We have been especially uh, pleased to review and endorse the work of our Safe Routes to School program, the, the city Safe Routes to School program, brought before us by Public Works and under the watchful, supportive eye of our PAC member, Julie Danzel from Minneapolis Public Schools. And in the, also in the past year, our programs and policies subcommittee looked at, took on dozens of uh, initiatives and topics, providing this to the city resolutions of support and recommendations for, to name a few, the Minneapolis ADA Transition Plan for Public Works, Winter Sidewalk Maintenance, the Minneapolis Racial Equity Framework for Transportation, uh, our city's Shared Mobility Program, Vision Zero Action Plan, and the Minneapolis Climate Equity Plan. Uh, we see our work set against a backdrop of, of um, safety, climate, 
and uh, pedestrian dignity. Now, uh, it's worsening street safety. We're in consecutive years of, of increasing crashes, injuries, and deaths, um, soaring consequences from climate breakdown are in our, our, in our news every day and worsening. And uh, offsetting these on a positive note is an emerging advocacy both locally and national, nationally towards pedestrian dignity that is going beyond design compliance and safety features to affirmatively make walking feel right and preferable. Uh, for, for today's report, I appreciate the opportunity here to highlight shared values and objectives that, within the contours of our PAC members' varied lives and experiences, we do hold in common and strive to express in our work. First being that of connection, you know, in three ways to begin with, where PAC is, we feel we see ourselves connected to the efforts of individuals and groups working to make Minneapolis more accessible inclusive and livable through active transportation and public transit. Also in terms of connection, we value being that body connected directly to our city leaders in the shared mission of safe, comfortable, accessible walking and rolling. And a third critical PAC connection that we sense is one of universality in that on any trip any one of us takes, we're all a pedestrian at some point. Here, uh, Heidi Vader, <laughs> um, my, my spouse, committed, passionate, devoted, even chauvinist bicyclist. She has to take she has to take the alley on foot in the winter when it's iced and rutted. Um, so we all are at some point. Uh, going further on uh, safe movement and in, in, uh, the, in, in winter, um, the topic of winter sidewalk conditions returns year after year to pack at the urging of our members, and just the same year after year, in any time we're talking, our members are talking with friends, family, anywhere we're talking with the public. People can't wait to talk about snow and sidewalks and getting around. PAC is eager to contribute to emerging winter maintenance initiatives with goals of safe winter passage of our sidewalks and priority removal of recurrent permanent feeling ice and snow at our street corners. Uh, going on to safe movement year-round, Minneapolis's other season brings its own barriers to comfortable movement on our sidewalks and street crossings. This slide from Nicol Nicolet Avenue south, south of Diamond Lake just this summer shows in a great project, we're making ADA ramps and bump outs, just the same, we're showing what is routine blocking of open sidewalks. These aren't, these aren't signed off sidewalks, they're open sidewalks blocked off with large orange advisory signs. Signs chosen haphazardly, we'll look at this, uh, that is clearly freeway scale signage, and placed heedlessly without, without thought to having made the sidewalk impassable for those traveling in wheelchairs or other assistance devices. This seems to be an easily remedied operations matter given attention and PAC is pleased to provide, to provide that attention in the year ahead. These next two, climate and dignity, I will take these together at the uh, urging of our committee members. The complementary ability of climate breakdown inspired action and pedestrian dignity to hasten mode shift. Mode shift goals set out in the Minneapolis Transportation Action Plan across all categories boil down to one thing, that's, that's in the orange at the end, that is uh, moving single occupant motor vehicles over to walking, biking, and transit. Climate breakdown demands that we act to dramatically and drastically reduce fossil fuel consumption. And it is towards greater active transportation and transit that climate pushes us. At the same time it is pedestrian, at the same time it is pedestrian dignity that will pull us. In surveying our members, one quote carried the consensus for me the consensus view, and that is, quote, I don't see the immediacy of climate, of climate breakdown being dealt with consistently, end quote. And that goes for PAC as much as the city structure as a whole and its agencies and governing bodies and the general public. You can expect PAC to emphasize climate urgency and action in its project resolutions and place all of our work squarely within the context of climate breakdown. 
And, and now as stark realities of climate breakdown push us necessarily towards planet safe transportation modes like walking, the realization, the actualization of pedestrian dignity will pull us. Inherent to pedestrian dignity are first what we can provide as a city that is safety, comfort, and heavily implicit in both those, freedom from barriers. Barriers, um, barriers like crosswalks blocked by moving traffic and stationary signs, permanent barriers like sidewalk corners still without ramps, 35 years past the passage of the Americans with Disabilities Act, and then seasonal barriers like um, foot high snow at the street corners that we've seen, iced over sidewalk alley crossings, and back to our other road construction season, uh, large construction vehicles placed with no consideration of those moving outside of vehicles. Uh, in our slide here, we see, uh, we see convenient, proportionate, and roomy pedestrian travel as possible and evident and apparent and even routine in parts of Minneapolis, even in the snowiest, iciest winters. Gladly, what we gain campaigning for and delivering pedestrian dignity is just as inherent when people find walking safe, comfortable, and compelling. We gain health where more and more uh, general vitality and longevity are connected to a simple principle and practice of moving. No magic number of steps or even minutes, but moving versus not moving as a determiner of long-term health. Uh, we gain community, seeing pedestrian life as more than a walk around the lake. It is the excursion for groceries, the, the connection to transit, routine yet priceless parent-child togetherness, trekking to school, decompressing after work, and communing, communing with urban life and nature. Finally, those add up to we, what the joy we gain when we appreciate the accidental encounters and moments a person can find when walking, moving at a natural human pace. These passing singular meetings with places, people, and beings of all kinds that are just not present in other forms of transportation. Um, wrapping up with the we have PAC is continually thankful for the wisdom and contributions of our agency members from Minneapolis CPED, Public Health, Minneapolis Public Schools, Minneapolis Parks, and those from the University of Minnesota, Metro Transit, Met Council, MnDOT, and Hennepin County. Uh, looking ahead, our membership hotly anticipates projects and initiatives headed our way, uh, evolving and continuing programs like Vision Zero, Winter Sidewalk Maintenance, and Safe Routes to School, and infrastructure projects like, uh, though the work may be a year or two ahead, the planning and design for the Franklin Avenue, Lindale Avenue South, and Cedar Avenue reconstructions. Uh, we're also pleased to have welcomed four new members this summer, and they're, along with their energy, ideas, and commitment to a great Minneapolis. Thank you, and with that, I turn things over to Alyssa. Welcome. I managed to break the PowerPoint before I even started talking. Uh, thank you, Committee Chair Johnson, committee members. It is my pleasure to be with you today uh, with the committee for our uh, annual report. The group of volunteers, city professionals, and agency partners that make up our committee are a thoughtful, fun, and values-driven group of people who care very much about our city. And they care about the work of Minneap making Minneapolis a better place to live, work, and bike because they share many of the same values you do. I stood up here last year to talk to you about those values. Those values are no less important today. The impacts of climate breakdown are ever more apparent as we emerge from a summer characterized by wildfire smoke and into fall reports that recent droughts are draining the aquifers that supply millions of Minnesotans with drinking water. As the oil trade continues to fuel increasingly global conflicts in an endless series of wars, as traffic pollution causes ongoing severe and deadly health problems, as traffic crashes continue to kill members of our community, the cost of cars is too high. As we reflect back on 2022, the work of the BAC continues to be grounded in these realities. The last year has been full of milestones. 
In 2022, Minneapolis committed to a design that, while not living up to the full potential of our policy goals, will make Hennepin Avenue a much better street for the people who live, work, and play along the corridor. As someone who bikes that corridor right now, I'm very excited to bike that corridor when it looks radically different. Uh, Minneapolis was host to the amazing community building power of open streets for the 11th year since its inception in 2011. Minneapolis piloted a neighborhood traffic calming program that received about 70 applications on very short notice, another really important shift toward quick build solutions that are data driven. And yet, not all the milestones we experience are good ones. City department representatives on the BAC who provide context for members of the public are on track to be removed by the city clerk's office. Severe and fatal traffic crashes continue to be a regular occurrence on our streets. The impacts of the climate crisis, as I already discussed, uh, are ever more apparent. And while we passed the Transportation Action Plan in 2020, we have floundered in our ability to implement the visionary goals and strategies our city has committed to and remedy these outcomes. This is a moment to ask, why? Unsurprisingly, we on the BAC have some ideas. <laughs> Um, three years in, the BAC has yet to see a fiscal analysis that would identify what it would cost to implement the strategies in the bicycling section of the Transportation Action Plan, let alone all the complementary strategies in other sections of the plan necessary for success. While keeping the vision separate from the cost was really important when developing the plan to ensure we didn't let existing financial context constrain our analysis of what was needed, we're now in an implementation stage. How can we plan to do things if we don't know what they cost and we have no plan to pay for them? Cities don't run on hope alone and neither should the transportation action plan. So we're missing some very important pieces of the plan, a budget and a payment plan. Why don't we have them yet? There are many answers to this question, but one that is within our city's control is a question of a capacity. Let me elaborate. In the last few years, about half the Public Works TPP staff have turned over. Projects are bounced from staff member to staff member to staff member as people leave. One current project that has come to the BAC several times, the Phillips Traffic Safety Project, is now in its third set of project managers. And these project managers, ambitious as they may be, have limits. They can only accomplish so much. It's not news that when faced with new ideas, it's always less work to say no and keep doing things the way we've always done them than to change things. I've seen over and over again, committee members suggest big transformative ideas where implementation would take time, attention, and creativity but it's apparent that capacity is an issue. Put simply, the city barely has enough staff to keep things going as is, much less make the kinds of transformative changes we've committed to in the Transportation Action Plan. Our city needs big changes in creative thinking. It needs capacity. When I asked our committee members what they wanted you as our city's leaders to know, they shared dozens of creative, exciting, and fun ideas. They wanted to talk to you about bike fleets for schools, about what an easy win it would be to improve our wayfinding practices, about project ideas to secure competitive federal dollars, about neighborhood greenways and neighborhood greening, about how to make bike share more resilient in our city, about the impact of climate analysis and narrative in our transportation decisions, about piloting a community shared cargo bike program, about ways to make the permitting process for bike corrals more accessible in residential areas, about right-sizing the vehicles in our winter maintenance fleet, about what it might look like if we stopped designing our communities street by street and instead took a system-wide approach so that communities and business owners uh, like Tracy, who was up here earlier, could rely on a system level change rather than one single corridor. If the recent past is any evidence, all of this energy and these community-driven ideas are going to hit a wall of no, not necessarily because of a lack of values alignment, but because of a lack of capacity. On paper, we are all on the same page. We have the visionary policies based on equitable engagement that's already been done. It's time to implement that, and to do it, we need people power. Not just advocates with a vision for a different landscape in our communities, but enough capacity that our city staff have the time, the attention, the creative thinking necessary for seriously advancing transformative solutions to the climate and equity issues of car-first infra infrastructure. We're designing for the communities we have, not the communities we want. It's what we know how to do. But we need to map out something different. This year's budget process can be one where we seriously consider what would public works need to not only deploy our existing resources differently, but to have the right amount of resources for the task ahead. What would substantial progress look like a year from now? A few specific things. A public fiscal analysis that tells us what the transportation action plan would cost. 
a public funding plan that identifies potential sources of funding to implement, and a staffing plan that would give us the human resources to actually do the work we've committed to doing. That last one is key. Frankly, we are unlikely to get a public fiscal analysis and funding plan without providing additional staff resources dedicated to that purpose. And if we don't resource our city specifically to get this done, we'll be back here in a year with the same problem, a transportation action plan with no budget, no plan to pursue resources, and no feasible way of getting all that work done in time to curb the worst impacts of climate breakdown in our communities. Change takes resources. Let's commit to providing them so that we can accomplish the things that we all want, our shared goals, a city that is safe, joyful, and sustainable. Thank you. Thank you. All right, I will turn to Council Member Wansley with the comment or question. Thank you, Chair Johnson. And I just want to say thank you to our PAC and BAC um, committee members for sharing that, especially this last couple of uh, slides of what needs to happen right now. Um, you hit it on the head in terms of what we've heard around some of the other ordinances that we've passed, like the climate equity plan, where we spent several months talking about a robust climate change you know, policy packet, and yet community members said, well, where's the staffing? Where's the dollars to implement these things? Um, and I hear you <laughs> raising those same concerns in this, this, um, in this moment too of we passed somewhat a, a robust transfer, transportation action plan. Where is the money to actually implement it? Where is the staffing support needed um, to fully implement it? So um, I hear that. I look forward to working with my colleagues to figure out how to move some of the things that you highlighted here of a, like a public fiscal analysis. That is something that we have a legislative department now they should be able to do, um, especially now that we have fiscal um, specialists who are lined up to do these type of analyses. Um, we'll love to continue working with our public works leadership to also look at a pathway of doing an analysis of a funding plan, especially since this morning, um, we learned that there's going to be some staffing um, capacity added to the intergovernment relations team to look at I, um, the uh, IRA and IIJA uh, grants. So we have supports. We know many of our departments are going after these competitive dollars to support either our climate change work, also our transportation action plan work. I don't see them as separate. Um, how can we kind of unify those to address many of the concerns that you just raised on behalf of the committee. So really look forward to working with my colleagues to really figure out some next steps that we can bring back to this committee to be responsive to what was raised. Thank you, council member. I am not seeing any other comments or questions. I'll just say thank you again for the presentation. It's really great. All the work that goes on, all the uh, efforts and input and all these recommendations as well. Thank you. So not seeing any other uh, comments or questions, I will direct the clerk to receive and file this presentation. And we will move on to our final item today, which is receiving and filing an update on the legislative directive relating to the expansion of Metropolitan Council's transit assistance program. Director Anderson Kelleher, who will be presenting on this item. Thank you, Mr. Chair and committee members. We are joined today by my colleague, Director of 311, Moembe Nazimbi, as well as her colleague, Brianna Phelps. Phelps. And um, can I, I just want to give a little preface to this. This is an idea that came about through a set of conversations with First Council Member Chavez and the question of how could we, I mean, the goal being, honestly, free metro transit eventually, somehow, in this region. But to get there, part of the solution um, looked at is this existing program that Metro Transit has called the TAP. Uh, transit assistance program. And so my colleague and her colleagues have been so generous to look at how this program could be made more available to Minneapolis residents. Thank Wonderful. you. Welcome. Thank you. Um, Chair Johnson, council members, my name is Mwenden Zimbi and I am the director of the newly formed 311 Service Center Department. And I am here leading a team of amazing city staff who, um, with whom we have worked hard for the last three months to explore the potential to expand the transit assistance program to the city of Minneapolis. 
Um, this report and the work that we did was a, a result um, of the legislative directive that was issued in June this year. And today we're here to present the report of the work that we did. Um, to present this high level analysis, 311 Service Center worked with staff from the following city departments, city attorney's office, uh, finance, and IT. Uh, the analysis we did centered on the transit assistance program, which we will refer to um, all through this presentation as TAP. Um, and uh, it's being administered through the Minneapolis Service Center. That is what we were looking at, uh, which is uh, the service center is a division within the 311 Service Center Department. And as you may know, the service center was opened a little over two years ago as a result of consolidating the five counters that existed at the city. And in place, we now have a beautiful 10,500 square foot of space that is and has been invited to the public um, and is now serving as a one-stop shop for a variety of city services across multiple city departments. Um, in the planning for the service center um, about two years ago, the city had a vision of it becoming the hub for all city external, city in-person external services. And we started with nine departments and divisions, and we have since started onboarding other city departments to the service center. Now with this work that we did, um, I want to acknowledge that customers to city counters and now the service center have primarily been city departments. So our customers have been internal to the cities, other city departments. So this is really the first time that we are exploring taking on a service that is owned and operated by an entity outside of the city of Minneapolis. Um, that said, I will jump into what is TAP. Um, to provide an overview of the program. So TAP is a program that is designed to make public transit more affordable for people with lower incomes. People love, across the metro area need resources to deal with tough times, but sometimes what they really need is being able to get to those resources. So what this program provides is affordable uh, transit for people to reach their jobs, uh, groceries, drug stores, housing, schools, and healthcare, among other uh, areas. TAP is administered by Metro Transit, which is a part of the Metropolitan Council, and it provides a reduced fare pass on a go-to card, just the regular go-to card that we all know, which allows customers to use Metro Transit bus or light rail for just a dollar a ride. And um, they only also pay the dollar a ride during rush hour, it's the same fare. And uh, included in this uh, TAP program is a two and a half hour transfer, meaning that if you're riding the, the bus or light rail and you um, scan your card, you'll be charged a dollar and that ride will be uh, valid for two and a half hours. And li lastly, it provides a discount on Southwest buses and the North Star train. Areas that we looked at during um, our analysis we looked at how the Metro Transit administers step because that will give us an idea of what can be done at the service center. We looked at a couple case studies, um, how are the local jurisdictions around us are um, utilizing TAP if they are. Uh, we came up with a recommendation um, and then we'll also be hearing from IT finance in our city attorney's office on uh, some of the requirements or implications and limits to what we looked at. And then lastly, uh, we'll close with a proposed timeline for implementation if we are to move ahead with the program. Um, so how Metro Transit administers STAP? Um, so uh, the first thing that will need to be done is to enter into a TAP partner agreement with the Metropolitan Council and becoming a TAP partner is free. We need to fill out a form, the city needs to fill out a form and then get into that um, contractual obligation with the Metropolitan Council. The uh, go-to cards, so when uh, people are registered into the TAP program, as I mentioned, they receive the regular go-to card that looks the same. It's just the same card as it all other writers and uh, has the same benefits as 
um, to, as a go-to cards in addition to it be uh, the, the tap benefits. And uh, some of the benefits are like, you know, storing, it uh, stores the transfers that I talked about, the two and a half hour transfer. And also it provides balance protection where customers can load any amount of money and it will keep on uh, reducing as they ride the bus. Um, the one dollar fare lasts a full year. So every, uh, for one full year, they'll be riding the bus for a dollar. Um, if they are approved into the program and it can be renewed up to two months prior to expiration. And lastly, the discounted price is not valid on Metro Mobility or Transit Link and uh, it provides a partial discount on the North Star and Southwest fares. Eligibility into the TAP program. Um, so who is eligible? So individuals with income levels at or below the 50% AMI, the area meridian, uh, median income, or 185% um, of federal poverty guidelines um, are eligible to the program. Uh, we heard from Metro Transit that over half a million metro area residents are eligible for TAP, but only a fraction have enrolled. And we also did find out that approximately uh, 15, only 15,000 people use a tap card at least once last year. So it is an opportunity that is not really being um, high, uh, highly explored or used. And then the last uh, part of the eligibility is that US citizenship is not a requirement to participate in the tap program. Uh, what is the process for tap partners? Um, this slide would outline what the TAP administrative process is for partners, which is also the process that the service center would follow if the city of Minneapolis were to become a TAP partner. Uh, so first of all, upon walking into the service center, because we are an in-person service, applicants or customers would need to fill out a TAP application form and provide proof of eligibility. What does that look like? So a service, enter, a service center agent would uh, confirm eligibility in several ways. Uh, first way is by uh, directly looking at pay stubs or tax returns. And the second way of doing that is indirectly using one of uh, dozens of accepted documents like um, an EBT card or a medical assistance card. At the service center, we would be uh, leaning towards more towards the indirect option. Uh, we also did find out as part of the process for TAP is that uh, the income eligibility documents um, are not collected or stored in any way, so we would not be collecting those. All uh, agents need to do is just need to check, to check a box on the application form stating that they have viewed the documents. Um, another process piece is that TAP accepts all forms of ID used for same day voting in Minnesota, like a utility bill, a lease, or school ID, and many others. And applicants must, must also present a photo ID or alternate format of identification as proof of identity. So these are the requirements of the process that will be followed to uh, enroll a customer into, this, in, into the TAP program. And once the partner um, or service center agents receives all this information and they enroll the customer and issue them the go-to card, um, it, will ben it will provide, that card will provide all the benefits of the TAP program. The next step after this would be for the customer to add value. Once they're given the go-to card to go and add value uh, or funds to the card. So normally this is where the enrollment to the program ends for most partners um, with Metro Transit. We, however, the service center are passionate about the service delivery and, and we strive to do what's right by our customers because we have the space, um, an inviting space, and we are, are reimagining a service deliver, delivery model, uh, model where we are looking at uh, delivering outcomes that are based on constituent needs, expectations, and preferences. And so because of this, the team felt the need to see, explore what we can do uh, over and above just issuing the customer the card and saying these are the ways that you can go, go and add value either online or at the light rail uh, machines and all that kind of stuff. So how can we really help them in using the space that we have 
to live up to our vision of being a one-stop shop that we are and provide ease for our constituents and customers to further assist them add value to their go-to cards once approved into the TAP program. And um, with the next slide, options for adding value to the TAP card, I will now invite our newest member of the Service Center Department Leadership Team, uh, Brianna Phelps, uh, to present the next slides. And she is our Operations Manager, and she is currently overseeing both the Service Center and the 311 Call Center. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Chair Johnson and council members. Um, as Director Nizambi said, my name is Brianna Phelps, and I am the new operations manager um, for 311 Service Center. Um, and in my 13 years here at the city, um, I did have the opportunity to work with Mwende at the service center, helping get it, the new service center created and off the ground and running. So I'm very excited to see um, a new uh, service, important service for the city, um, offered at the service center. Um, so I will, um, I have the opportunity to go over two pieces of this. One is adding value to the tap card and the other is our um, case studies. So adding value to a tap card, um, once customers receive their cards, they can either add that at enrollment um, or they can do so later if that's not something they wanna do right away. Um, there are four options that um, a customer can utilize to add value. Um, some of these options we can offer immediately if we choose to offer this at the service center. Um, some of them we would have to look at it maybe a future possibility, so it kind of allows for a phased approach. Um, just to note, for all of these options, Metro Transit does not accept prepaid debit cards, nor do they re provide refunds of any kind. Um, so the first option is using the Metro Transit online store. Um, so this is accessed via the URL you see there, and it is usable by anyone with access to the internet and a browser. Um, it is pretty straightforward. You can actually see on the screenshot, um, if you look in the upper right-hand corner, you see that little go-to symbol. Whenever someone gets to the Metro Transit site, they click on that. That takes them straight to that go-to store. They can add value from there. And they have the option to use a credit card or debit card to add value. Um, from a service center standpoint, this is a bit more difficult to implement at, the actual, um, at our actual counters for two specific reasons. One, um, the visibility of our screens that our um, service center agents use. We do have a monitor cover for them, but if someone's standing directly behind them, there's a potential that they could see us entering those numbers. Um, the other piece is that... Um, I'm going to move my notes here, sorry about that. Um, oh, I'm blanking on the other piece because I didn't make a note of it. Um, do you remember the piece? Um, Chair Jones and Council Members, I think the other piece is that I, if um, an agent is at the counter and they, are, they take the credit card and they're entering it on behalf of the customer, um, if they make an error, like Brianna mentioned, we're not able to issue a refund. Mm -hmm. So we do not, that it, 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 it uh, brings about liability issues for the city yes. because we cannot uh, get a refund for an error that has been committed by one of our agents. Thank you. And sorry about that. And the other piece um, is that for the service center, um, if they were entering it into the system, this is an outside financial system that's not within the city, so it's not our own um, system they'd be working in. All that said, um, we do have four self-service computers that are available for customer use, and we have confirmed that these are an option for customers to use. They can go onto these computers. Metro Transit's website correct, connects directly to our city webpage, so they can access it, and they can process payments. This is not on the city network. Um, we actually have people that process utility billing payments there, so this is an, absolutely an option. And our customer service agents can go over there to provide general guidance. They would obviously not enter the payment on that person's behalf, but they could provide general guidance to help them out on the site. Um, the second option is calling Metro Transit Customer Relations Line. Um, this is usable by anyone with access to a telephone. Um, they can pay by credit or debit card, since it's over the phone, they obviously can't do cash. Um, the customer relations staff can be reached at the phone number you see there, and they are very well trained to provide assistance, um, not only for adding value, but they can answer any wide variety of transit questions that uh, someone might have. 
They also have interpretation in over 180 languages. And um, from the service center um, side of things, we do have a public phone, not only at our large main counter, yellow counter, but there are two alcoves that we have that have um, phones available there that a customer could use. And those alcoves would provide a discrete location for someone. If you're speaking a credit card number over the phone, you want privacy, you don't want people around you. So that would provide that option. Um, the next few options that we'll look at are, the next two are possible future options. Um, so the first one is a, what's called a contact, compact point of sale device. Um, these devices, uh, someone can add value as needed. Um, if this were implemented at the service center, we would be invoiced by Metro Transit. Um, I think they typically do on, a, say, a monthly basis. Um, funds are available to customers immediately if they use this option. What that uh, device requires is internet access and a legacy phone line, um, landline uh, hookup. These devices are, from Metro Transit side, considered owned by Metro Transit, but they provide them free of charge to us. It also means that they will take care of maintenance. Their techs would handle any difficulties um, should anything like that arise. Um, if, uh, if this were to come at the service center, it is possible to install two units. We would have one at each of our main yellow counters, so for easy access, and if we're helping customers wherever they're at, they can utilize that device. Um, this option is also actually available, um, and it's used by hundreds of authorized retailers, specifically including Cub Foods. Um, this has been something that I think they've used for a fair amount of time, and a number of community nonprofits. Um, this item is considered a possible future option for a number of reasons. Legal and finance will cover a few, but uh, very specifically, they're not providing these currently. These are older devices that they are looking at um, upgrading. So they're actually working with a third party to find a solution that would have um, easier hookups, just a better running device at this time. So they've told us they're not getting any new ones and they're not currently giving them out for that very specific reason. Um, the other, the fourth option, and another possible future option is a, a ticket vending machine or TVM. So this is the large ticket machines that you see at all light rail stations. They're available at some transit stations. And they provide, um, they take cash, credit, debit cards. They provide tickets, whether you want to buy a ticket, or you can add value to your go-to card. Um, similar to the other option, funds are available immediately to um, a customer if they put funds on their go-to card. Um, if this were something that were to be implemented at the service center, it would be an opportunity for service center staff to help customers not only show them how to use the machines, how to add value so that when they go out into the community and any station where they see these, they will know how to have a better understanding and how to use them for in the future. Um, this option, unfortunately, is also not currently available. Um, so the, they, for kind of two reasons. One, they don't have any extras available. I think they said they have one or two, and they really only use those if one of their machines currently breaks down, they switch it out until they fix it. So they don't have any extras available for us. They are also, with this system, looking at a system-wide upgrade. So for all transit stations, light rail stations, that they're saying is about one and a half to two years out for upgrading all of this. So at the absolute earliest that we might um, dig into this with Metro Transit to see about a potential installation, we would be looking at at least two years, two and a half years out. Um, but it is something that we really do want to keep ongoing discussions going um, because we, we just see a lot of value in this one as well as the previous option if we can make them work. Um, so those were all of the ways that someone can add value. Um, the other item I'm going to cover is the case studies that we did. Um, so very specifically, I want to point out that um, there were a few people or a few jurisdictions that are not partners, um, one of which is Hennepin County as well as Ramsey County and the city of St. Paul. Um, we know that these would have been, and we were very, very much hoping they were partners because they would have been really great comparisons to see how do they do it and how that might look at Minneapolis. Um, so while they're not, we were able to speak to St. Paul Public Housing Authority, um, City of Brooklyn Park, and Dakota County. And we did also, I'll make mention, Minneapolis Public Housing Authority is also a partner. We did not get that information until uh, earlier this week, so we were not able to make a connection to with them before this presentation. 
Um, of those three jurisdictions that we all had a chance to talk to, they all handle things really in the same way. So they accept applications for TAP. Um, they will review them. If applicable, they will approve those applications. Um, once approved, they provide the person with a go-to card. They register that go-to card for them. And then they let the customer know that they can um, add funds to their go-to card at any point on their own. Um, these services, the, the, as a TAP partner for uh, Dakota County and for St. Paul Public Housing Authority are provided by social workers. Um, for St. Paul Public Housing Authority, it is only provided to their public housing residents, so they don't venture out beyond that. And then for Brooklyn Park, they provide this service at resource fairs. Um, none of those jurisdictions um, assist with any sort of transaction, adding funds to the cards. They don't do any sort of preloading cards with city or county funds, anything like that. They only provide um, application approval, a go-to card, and registering that card to the person. Um, and with those um, years that they have been partners, Brooklyn Park has been a, a partner with TAP for one year. Dakota County has been so for about four years. And then um, St. Paul Public Housing Authority has been a partner for five. And with that, that is um, my piece of it. I will invite um, Mowende back up to give our recommendations. Great. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, Ms. Phelps. So, um, after all that, the research that we did and the work that we put together um, in looking at other jurisdictions and uh, conversations with Metro Transit, these are the recommendations that we came up with. So we do recommend that the city of Minneapolis become a TAP partner. And implementation uh, of the partnership or rolling out this program, uh, we see it best done as a phased approach. Um, so phase one is where we actually uh, go and be become the top partner, fill out the form and work all um, that all out, and then start enrolling customers into the top program, um, issuing cards and providing guidance on where they can load the, the funds onto the card, of which the first two that uh, Brianna outlined are at the service center, we can help them with that because we have the space, we have the public computers that we, uh, they can use, and we have a public phone line and space uh, where we can provide privacy for them to do that. Um, and then as we do that, we will also be collecting data on how uh, many people en enroll in the TAP program through the service center. Phase two uh, is we will continue having conversations with finance and city attorney's office. Um, as well as met, Metro Transit uh, and looking at the possibility of installing that compact point of sale device that uh, right now they are not providing for new installations because it's going through an update. Um, again, this is conversation that we'll need to start, uh, we'll have with finance too because um, we will be collecting money from the public and holding it in a city account waiting for the Med Transit to invoice the city and then looking for how to transfer that money over to uh, Metro Transit. Uh, the service center collecting funds is not new because we do that right now uh, through credit card, cash, and, um, and checks. Actually, last year in 2022, we were able to bring in revenue over 25 million. So that is not the issue. The issue is how to, this is the first time that we'll be collecting uh, public funds for another agency and transferring it to them. So we'll need to have conversations around that and the legality around that. And then uh, phase two, during phase two, we'll also continue collecting data on how many people use the POS uh, point of sale device uh, to load their cards. Uh, phase three is longer term. It's that um, beautiful looking um, ticket vending machine that you sell, uh, and that is also not available. Actually, Metro Transit mentioned that they have never provided it to a partner because no partner has had space or wanted it, so this is new. And we have the space to be able to do that, and this actually would be the ideal way that we would want to look up uh, to do this program because if we have that TVM machine, we don't need the POS, we don't need um, the, the uh, our customers to make the call, we don't need all of that because that machine provides everything that they need to 
um, be able to load their cards. Um, so uh, we'll be looking into that possibility. We are not gonna stop if, the, if um, it is recommended that we go ahead with the partnership. And then the data that we collect from phase one and phase two will uh, provide us with a benchmark to in, um, evaluate investing in a TVM. Uh, currently, they did let us know that it costs them around 15,000 for one of the TVM machines, but we don't know what that will look like once they have the updated one. So uh, the data will kind of look, give us the um, information that we need to see evaluate that investment. Thank you, we have a comment or a question from Councilmember Wansley. Oh, perfect, all right. Thank you, so Let's I will continue. call on um, Dave Roth from IT. Chair Johnson, Council Members, and David Roth, I'm the Director of IT Business Services. And basically I'm here today to present uh, the technology perspective of, uh, for each fa proposed phased approach of this TAP program. For phase one, um, some of this might be a little bit of a repeat, so I apologize, but uh, we have a cumatic ticketing queuing system. And with that, we can add the tap option. So when the customer comes in to the kiosk, they can choose the tap option. It'll print a ticket, and then when they're called, that number is called or that ticket is called, then the service agent can work with them on their tap needs. And then also we have the four self-service PCs we can add a link to those uh, four self-service PCs for the customers to go into the Metro Transit website and uh, they can go in and add funds to their go-to card. So that's what we can do for phase one uh, successfully. For phase two, we have the con contact point of sale device. That's another option for customers to add funds to their go-to card. Um, that capability, uh, uh, we could move forward with that once Metro Transit has the wireless option capability of that technology, and they're working on that right now, okay? And then phase three, the ticket vending machine. If approved, IT would gather the requirements, we'd do an assessment, and then we move forward with, with, that, with that option, so. All right. And next we have Mark from Finance. Okay, thank you. Welcome. Hello, Council um, Chair Johnson and Council Members. Um, I'm Mark Schaefer with the Finance Department. I'm the interim controller right now. So um, the financial considerations would be as follows. For phase one, which is the um, enrollment of customers in the program, um, there would be a, a consideration for uh, one, one new um, customer service or service center, FTE, to provide the customer assistance with enrolling the um, or determining eligibility and then enrolling them, assisting with enrolling them in the program. So, um, and then phase two would be um, that the contact point of sale device requires a credit card machine along with it. And so the cost of each credit card machine would range from $300 to $850. And then there'd be ongoing costs for the maintenance of the credit card machines. And then the other costs would be associated with Every time a customer would be using the um, card, the credit card, there's like a transaction fee, a credit card fee, so that would be um, additional costs there. Um, phase three is the ticket vending machine, and the cost of that machine currently is around $15,000. So, um, and then based on customer assistance of needed for with working with that um, machine, it may, it may require another FTE some point and then finally just the preloaded tap card option um, just that's considered a gift card and the state auditor's office state auditor has kind of issued an opinion kind of um, against using those it's an adverse opinion so to speak so that's all for me so all right director yeah. um if if you just stay for a second yes. mark um yeah. how is a preloaded card a gift card when it can only be used for one certain activity, a ride on transit? It, it's kind of considered a gift card, and, and maybe the attorney can speak to it even more than myself. Um, it, it's a gift card because it's not, um, I think it's because there's really no, they haven't provided a service, so it's, it's kind of like a, 
there's no um, reimbursement in base with it. It's just a, it's a gift card for use for them for for um, a, um, for their their use. Not I don't know if that makes so, sense. So so no, it doesn't make sense. So I'm just going to say this, Mr. Okay. Chair. I think this is a great area to explore with our legislators to have a law change here. If this is really what's happening, because. To me, if we're ever going to make mode shift goals and we cannot do something like this, then we are just at the mercy of some sort of bureaucratic nightmare. So let me, I'm just putting it out there. Sorry, that's a little more of an opinion than I would sure. usually share, but there are several things on this list. The Met Council just received, will be receiving a half a billion dollars uh, through the sales tax. I think they can provide us with the fifteen thousand uh, dollar reload machine too. So, just uh, sharing with some policymakers some ideas. No, that's appreciated. And before we have any more discussion or this goes further, we're about to lose our quorum here. And so, just to play it safe, I am going to direct the clerk without any objections to receive and file the presentation. However, we can continue uh, having our presenters wrap up and uh, discussion from our remaining committee members. So. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Johnson, committee members. I am going to talk about the legal implications. My name is Tiffany Spore. I'm from the city attorney's office. And I'm going to start with the preloaded tap cards. I'm just going to start there, kind of at the bottom, since we were just discussing that. Currently under state law, by the way the legislator has written various state laws, the state auditor has issued an opinion that cities cannot and government agencies cannot use and give out gift cards. A tap card, just like a gift card to say Cub or a specific coffee shop, because it is preloaded with money for a specific purpose, would fall into that gift card category as state law is right now. As uh, Director Anderson Kelleher noted, it is a great opportunity for the city to talk with state legislators and potentially enact that change so that it could be a possibility in the future. The issue right now is just simply, as it is right now, the city cannot legally do that at the moment. Doesn't mean it isn't possible with a state law change in the future. Starting with phase one, there are not a lot of legal issues or complications with phase one. It will require council approval for the specific TAP contract. In addition, there is a minimal increase in city liability with city staff members handling people's personal documentation for the confirming that they are eligible for the TAP program. However, as we are not taking into consideration keeping any copy of those or keeping that documentation, that is a very minimal amount of liability as we give, do give it back to the individuals at the end of the process. Phase two actually from a legal perspective is one of our more complicated phases. This has to do that there are quite large substantial legal questions about whether or not the city can act as a financial intermediary for Metro Transit. So that doesn't have to go necessarily directly into us handling the specific credit cards or running the credit cards, but it does have to do with us essentially t obtaining funds and holding funds for another agency. Uh, I've done a minor deep dive into the legal implications for that, and right now we're at a point where there's nothing that really says we can't do it, but there's also nothing that gives us the authority to do that. So that would be a further legal question that would need to be answered and looked into pretty deeply before the city could go forward with that phase two specifically those go-to card readers. The additional, it does have additional impact on liability for the city, and that comes from us actually physically handling the cards, placing cards into the system. Because it's not for city purposes, it is, again, for another organization. It also means that if a city employee accidentally put 100 instead of 10, that the city has a liable aspect there because Metro Transit does not do refunds. So that could come back in a lawsuit against the city. So it does increase liability for the city in doing that type of work at the go-to counter, to do the go-to card tap process at those counters. Again, if we did enter into a contract to do that, this would require a contract specifically with Metro Transit that would have to go through council approval to be able to do that. 
Phase three, actually, the ticket vending machine has far fewer legal implications than actually phase two does. That is because these ticket vending machines actually are directly connected to Metro Transit. So the funding goes directly to Metro Transit. There's no intermediary role that the city plays in that. They get the cash, they get the credit card transactions. Those credit card, tra credit card transaction fees that were mentioned by finance, again, all Metro Transit which creates a much smaller liability issue for the city. The only real minor issues that you'd want to look at is placement of the machine so that we ensure that people using it do have the ability to pull out their card in a safe environment without fear of being overlooked through their shoulders. And that concludes my legal presentation. I will turn it back to Mwende. Thank you. And our last slide is about the proposed timeline. But before I delve into this, I just wanted to make sure that uh, we all understand that the preloaded cards uh, that we're talking about is um, we, we look to, it's not once we issue the card, the customer can go and load money into that card their own money into that card, so that's good. The preloaded uh, cards that we're talking about is if the city were ever to consider to provide assistance and uh, load those cards with city funds, uh, where um, as we issue, once we uh, enroll people into the TAP program, uh, we've seen where some other programs in, in other areas, uh, other local jurisdictions, they will uh, provide assistance and maybe load that card with $10 or $20 and have the customer use it. So those are the preloaded cards that we were talking about where they, that is considered a gift card um, by the Office of State Auditor opinion. Uh, proposed timeline for implementation. Currently, we have um, a couple pr uh, priorities, competitive priorities um, I, in our department at the 311 Service Center. We are in the process of onboarding city data requests from the city clerk's office to the service center with a go live date of October 16th. And then we're also in the process of hiring a new manager of support services who essentially would be the person who would be coordinating uh, such an effort and uh, with a a projected start date of mid-October to early November. So that said, if we were to go ahead with implementing phase one of this uh, program, we would need about four months preparation to implement. And what goes into that preparation is uh, updating uh, Qmatic, which is our queuing system, uh, working with IT to do that, um, making sure that TAP is loaded into our Qmatic system, into our um, into our kiosks uh, and also getting a training from Metro Transit on the process um, and also getting, making sure that we have the material um, to hand out um, on how to add cards or you know, more information about the program. And then phase two and three will be determined by Metro Transit and um, city resources and all the other conversations that you've heard about. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Thank you. We have a comment or question from Councilmember Wansley. Thank you, Chair Johnson. First, I just want to thank our staff for this update um, on this leg legislative directive. Um, I definitely support any program that either expands reduced fares or my also goal is altogether just eliminate fares from public transit so people ain't got to go through all these mixes. Um, but being able to enroll in $1 rides uh, for a year will be a huge benefit to, I know, thousands of residents, especially in my ward where I have thousands of students who greatly benefit and use uh, public transportation to get across the city. Um, I also wouldn't, in conversations, and, and this sounds like... Uh, in feedback that would need to be given to Metro uh, Transit as we're formulating our contracts with them. But it also seems like there needs to be some streamlining on their end. It was very um, concerning to see that, you know, there's almost half a million uh, residents that's currently eligible for this program and uh, less than a quarter is enrolled in it. And I can imagine it's a, a lot of bureaucratic paperwork that you have to go through that often in other, you know, assistance pro type programs can discourage people from wanting to partake um, in it. So I do think that is something that would have to re be relayed of like, even if we become a partner and be able to have this on site, how we're also not replicating some of their um, 
it seems like false <laughs> in actually encouraging people to participate and supporting them in a process so that they can be fully um, in, enrolled. Um, I also am excited to see, hopefully we could get to a place where we just get the vending machines. Um, and if there's also a way to relate this to Metro Transit of, can they also have those be along uh, loading stations, existing loading stations next to our go-to cards so that there's not the perception of, you know, uh, it just equity across the border. If we're going to have a go-to card, go-to uh, pass, like there should be um, a presence of both in loading stations. Um, so no one feels the same way that I know from um, – my own upbringing of pulling out your EBT card at Cubs or at a place is not often the most empowering feeling for folks. Um, so not wanting to feel singled out because you're also in need of assistance, um, I think is something that we also have to be cognizant in the placement of these machines that we want, you know, residents to be able to use to get the supports that they need. Um, but those were some of the immediate just concerns, which is nothing on our end. It's really just like Metro Transit, which seems to be a theme today. Um, so, um, I, but overall, I'm really excited that we're moving in this direction in any way council can support, especially around some of the litigation pieces. It seems like there would be some budgetary um, items that would be considered for us to move forward with acquiring, you know, the, the cards or whatever, if we got to a goal of purchasing stations, like would love to be part of those conversations and see this be implemented, at least at our service center. So thank you so much for your work on this. Thank you, Council Member Ping. Thank you, Chair Johnson. Yeah, I just wanted to say thank you. This is just really great work and I specific want, specifically wanna celebrate the collaboration. It actually started off as both me and Council Member Chavez independently pursuing a fair free transit program then we kind of came together and met with former council member uh, Robert Lilligren who's at the Met Council he guided us towards TAP we initially started working with Public Works and then we were working with the mayor's office and then we worked with your team and it's now coming together to something that looks like it can be real and it just happened because we had to collaborate so much both inside of City Hall and outside of City Hall so I'm just really glad to see that we've arrived here and I'm really excited about moving this work forward Great, thank you. And Director? Mr. Chair, I wanna thank my colleague uh, for all of her work on this and coordinating the team because it really, in the end, had to be coordinated in a place that has that direct public face, which we don't have as much in public works. I also wanna say we wanna brand this thing when it comes here to make sure it you know, fits with the As You Go campaign and Mode Shift campaign for Minneapolis, and we have some ideas about that, so we'll keep doing that. I do think the um, refill machine actually will work for regular um, go-card, uh, because when I was looking at those pictures, that is a regular sort of machine that um, then employees could go and get their go card and be able to refill their go card and things like that. And I think that too also helps us overall, just the, you know, the traffic to the service center to be able to have that there for residents. So this is exciting. Um, we're going to work on it. Um, I might have taken a screenshot of that picture of the issues and we'll get, we'll get working um, on those because they're important issues to solve for. And I really believe that this is a big step if we can offer this service to, you know, in, in the largest city in the state to be able to be a partner with Metro Transit on this and help, help lead the way. Thank you, thank and you. thank you as well for the presentation. Very thorough. Um, yeah, as we've already directed, receive and file on this, and so with no further business before us, we are adjourned. Thank you.